The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner, or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. Lectures on the Politics of God and the Politics of Man, Lecture 9 Socialism, Part 1 Historical Misconceptions In a newspaper article from the Catholic Times, dated 9th of November 2003, Robert Doyle related how Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Tegucigalpa in Honduras, Central America, who had apparently been tipped as a future Pope, had attacked capitalism as savage and called for a return to the principles of socialism. According to the report in the Catholic Times, the Archbishop said, and I quote, The historical achievements of the welfare state are being dismantled and, as a result, the differences between the rich and the poor are growing, unquote. The Archbishop further said that, and again I quote, Whereas states won a protagonist role on the economic terrain in the 20th century, Today, their power is decreasing more and more. Unquote. I do not intend to comment on the size of the state in Honduras, but the Cardinal was speaking of the world's situation and his talk addressed the issue of globalisation. It seems astonishing that anyone should make the claim that the power and influence of the modern state is decreasing. The situation in Europe is completely the reverse, with an ever growing European superstate that seeks to regulate and control just about every aspect of our lives and society. And this European superstate is thoroughly socialist. But what is more astonishing is this, that given the track record of socialist states from Hitler's Third Reich and Stalin's Soviet regime through to the tin-pot imitators of these oppressive states in the Third World, clergymen should see the socialist state as a liberator of the poor and a defender of the oppressed. More than any other form of state power, it has been socialist states that have oppressed the poor and tyrannised their peoples. And it should not be forgotten that the Soviet regime never claimed to have realised the communist ideal of society, but rather a socialist society. The unlearned Carnival stated, according to the Catholic Times report, that, and again I quote, A savage capitalism is returning which history has already judged harshly in view of the conditions to which it subjected the proletariat in the 18th and 19th centuries. This has increasingly been shown to be a biased and incorrect view of both capitalism and socialism. According to Eugene Rosenstock Hussey, and I quote, Neither Russian practice nor the later writings of Rosa Luxemburg, the only real successor to Marx, bear out this theory of exploitation. The class war between capital and labour is as true and as untrue as the sex war between man and wife, the age war between old and young, the border war between neighbouring groups. But the whole process is as complicated as the other conflicts mentioned above. In the struggle between the sexes, the man can exploit the woman and the woman can exploit the man. But there can also exist, after all, a happy marriage. In the class war, capital can exploit labour, but labour can also exploit capital. And there can be real peace, as there was in England between 1850 and 1882, to the great disappointment of Marx. English workers exploited the world in peaceful cooperation with English capitalists from 1846 to 1914. German workers exploited the capital-owning class together with the employers during the inflation of 1918 to 1923. During these years, the workers improved or at least kept up their standards. The people of means lowered theirs to little more than zero, 
because the inflation did not abolish wages, but capital. Unquote. The Industrial Revolution did not worsen the conditions of the working classes. It improved them greatly. And socialism did not improve the conditions of the working classes. It created worse conditions and led to their harsher treatment. The implementation of socialist economics in Russia following the revolution led to a decrease in standards of living for the masses. As a result, the peasants of Soviet Russia did not achieve the standard of living that they had enjoyed under Tsarist rule immediately prior to the revolution until the early 1950s. By contrast, the masses who voted with their feet to leave the land on which they were starving and work in the factories during the Industrial Revolution did not do so because they were forced by state decree to do this. This development was the result of progress in a free society. Ludwig von Mises stated the matter clearly in the following way, and I quote, The truth is that economic conditions were highly unsatisfactory on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. The traditional social system was not elastic enough to provide for the needs of the rapidly increasing population. Neither farming nor the guilds had any use for the additional hands. Business was imbued with the inherited spirit of privilege and exclusive monopoly. Its institutional foundations were licenses and the grant of a patent of monopoly. Its philosophy was restriction and the prohibition of competition both domestic and foreign. The number of people for whom there was no room left in the rigid system of paternalism and government tutelage of business grew rapidly. They were virtually outcasts. The apathetic majority of these wretched people lived from the crumbs that fell from the tables of the established castes. In the harvest season they earned a trifle by occasional help on farms. For the rest they depended upon private charity and communal poor relief. The factories freed the authorities and the ruling landed aristocracy from an embarrassing problem that had grown too large for them. They provided sustenance for the masses of paupers. They emptied the poor houses, the workhouses and the prisons. They converted starving beggars into self-supporting breadwinners. The factory owners did not have the power to compel anybody to take a factory job. They could only hire people who were ready to work for the wages offered to them. Low as these wage rates were, they were nonetheless much more than these paupers would earn in any other field open to them. It is a distortion of the facts to say that the factories carried off the housewives from the nurseries and the kitchens and the children from their play. These women had nothing to cook with and to feed their children. These children were destitute and starving. Their only refuge was the factory. It saved them, in the strict sense of the term, from death by starvation. It is deplorable that such conditions existed, but if one wants to blame those responsible, one must not blame the factory owners who, driven by selfishness of course, and not by altruism, did all they could to eradicate the evils. What had caused these evils was the economic order of the pre-capitalistic era, the good old days." Unquote. Despite von Mises' comment that the factory owners were driven by selfishness, not altruism, many factory owners did in fact engage in altruistic activities. And it is simply not true, as Rosenstock Hussey claims, that capitalism contributed nothing to the reproduction of man. An argument that takes no account of the dire conditions in which the masses found themselves on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Denis de Rougemont is similarly mistaken when he claims that, and I quote, Capitalism created nothing. It financed progress without paying royalties to its authors and to the detriment of its workmen. Unquote. As von Mises points out, and again I quote, The history of capitalism in Great Britain, as well as in all other capitalist countries, is a record of an unceasing tendency towards the improvement in the wage earner's standard of living." Unquote. Doubtless this on its own does not constitute the reproduction of man, but it did not appear on its own, and given the historical conditions neither was the reproduction of man possible without it, except for the privileged elite of society. The Industrial Revolution made possible for the many what was previously possible only for the few.
It is a romantic fable to imagine that the pre-industrial economy of Great Britain could provide the necessary social foundations for the reproduction of man given the conditions prevailing for the masses immediately prior to the Industrial Revolution. The same romanticisation of the pre-industrial agrarian economy of England is to be found in Christopher Dawson's essay, The Passing of Industrialism. According to Dawson, and I quote, The last age, the industrial age, was an age of exploitation and therefore its duration was limited. It was not simply a case of the exploitation of the weak by the strong, as in the last age of the Roman Republic. It was the exploitation of the world and its resources by man. The natural riches lying unused for ages were spent recklessly for the sake of immediate advantage, without thought of the future. It was the case of a pygmy, with the mind and aims of a pygmy, suddenly endowed with the power of a giant. In England, the whole powers of the nation were thrown recklessly into the struggle for exploitation. The welfare of the people, the moral law, were thrown aside in order that the newly discovered riches could be made profitable. That the iron and coal and cotton could be put on the world market and the riches of the exploiters increased. Thus there was not only no spiritual purpose in the process, there was not even a worthy human end. On the immense suffering and labour of the people was built up the hideous edifice of Victorian industrial society. Unquote. Dawson went on to predict that post-World War I society would return to an agrarian economy. But this analysis fails to take account not only of the real nature of the situation prevailing on the land prior to industrialization of the economy and the effects of the latter on the standard of living of the labouring masses, but also the very nature of the capitalist economic process itself. Dawson speaks as if the results of capitalism benefited only the few, entrepreneurs and industrialists, at the expense of the many, the workers. This is, of course, the Marxist-Communist perspective, but it is also a common attitude found among Roman Catholic intellectuals. But this kind of zero-sum characterization of the capitalist process is a misconception founded on economic ignorance. Capitalist entrepreneurs cannot make their profits unless the relative standard of living of society as a whole is increased by their activities. The growth of the industrial economies since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the general social and economic amelioration of all classes in society that has accompanied it stand testimony against this misconception. The lot of the labouring masses in England during the Industrial Revolution contrasted starkly with the treatment meted out to the peasants and working classes in Soviet Russia and other socialist states. In 1958, the German economist Wilhelm Röpke made the following comments on the contrast between the British Industrial Revolution and the implementation of enforced communist industrialization in Russia. And I quote, What is the misery of early British capitalism in comparison with the immense sacrifices of the Soviet experiment. The British had to wait a little while for the increase in mass prosperity and an improvement in labour conditions. But what is this in comparison with the long and still continuing sufferings of the masses in the communist state? Nor should we forget that Moscow's autarkic and collectivist method made the solution of another development problem much harder, namely the problem of feeding the growing industrial and urban population. In England and in other Western countries, development was accompanied by a steady and considerable increase in agricultural yields and at the same time the free world economy enabled the produce of the vast new cultivated areas of the new world to be used for feeding the industrial countries. But in Soviet Russia, communist economic methods led to a decline in agriculture which even now does not seem to have been made good if we are to judge by Russia's statistics and the observations of Moscow's rulers. Unquote. Everything that makes modern life in the West superior on the material level to the drudgery and poverty that countless masses have had to endure throughout history is the result of the economic organisation of society on the capitalist model operating in a free society underpinned by a Christian worldview.
This was the context in which economic progress changed the fate of the people of Britain and other Western nations. Modris Eckstein's writing about England in the Victorian era said that, and I quote, Perhaps the most important influence in the development of a vision of social order based on commonly accepted values was the growth of Protestantism and of Bible reading, especially in the wake of the Great Revival in the early 19th century. By the end of that century, a shared vision of social order was widely in place. This vision and its accompanying values were not imposed through social imperialism, but grew out of the religious environment and where this did not suffice, out of improved economic and social conditions. It is generally accepted that by the end of the Victorian era, most of the British population no longer had to struggle simply to subsist. A measure of comfort, however small, had been achieved in most cases. Consumption of meat instead of bread, of milk and eggs instead of just potatoes, was rising. In recent years, before the turn of the century, there had been a steady rise in real wages, a decline in family size, a drop in the consumption of alcohol and the beginnings of social welfare provisions. Archdeacon Wilson, headmaster of Clifton College, remarked in a speech to the Working Men's Club of St Agnes in 1893, quote, Possibly a future historian writing the history of the English people in this period will think much less of the legislative and even of the commercial and scientific progress of the period than of the remarkable social movement by which there has been an effort made by a thousand agencies to bring about unity of feeling between different classes and to wage war against conditions of life which earlier generations seemed to have tolerated. Unquote. Unquote. The real social problem caused by the Industrial Revolution was not economic exploitation of the proletariat by capitalists, but rather the loss of meaning to work and the dislocation of the natural and social rhythms of man's life as a consequence of the mechanisation of production. According to Jacques Ellul, the growth of the technical civilization that began with the Industrial Revolution, and I quote, dissociates the sociological forms, destroys the moral framework, desacralizes men and things, explodes social and religious taboos, and reduces the body social to a collection of individuals. Unquote. Nevertheless, the Industrial Revolution produced real progress over the long term for the masses, both economically and in terms of general social amelioration. But the solution to the loss of meaning to work and the dislocation of the natural and social rhythms of life caused by the mechanisation of production could not be solved by Marxism, which failed to understand man's true condition and therefore prescribed the wrong remedy. The masses who provided the labour necessary for large-scale industrialization could not and did not want to go back to the land on which they had previously starved. According to Elul, speaking of England, not France, and I quote, The new agricultural techniques were plainly so superior that it was not possible to preserve the old open field system, the commons, the pastures and the forests. Thus the final blow was dealt to the old organic peasant society. The peasant could not survive as such, and with him the whole of society entered into a state of flux. The plasticity we refer to came about in England as a result of this evolution in the use of land, which furnished the technical movement with the necessary manpower, apathetic, vacant and uprooted." Unquote. The problems posed by mechanisation of the economy were unavoidable if society was to experience economic and social progress. Marxism did not solve these problems of industrialization for society. It made them incalculably worse. Only where capitalism was able to flourish have these problems been overcome on the material level to any degree. The alternative to this painful process is not a better life for all on the land, but rather the economic and social stagnation of modern Africa. Capitalism, that is to say, the free market economic order, has been the most effective and successful means of achieving relative economic equality in society, though not absolute economic equality, which exists only at the level of abject poverty.
for example, subsistence living. Socialism, left to its logical conclusions, is, as history has shown, the most effective and successful means of achieving economic equality at the level of poverty, at least for the majority of people in society, the proletariat. Although it is to be noted that at least in the developed world, socialism is seldom left to run its course to the bitter end, and black markets, that is to say illegal free markets, which were encouraged by the authorities in some Soviet states, usually appear, enabling the economy to survive above the level of abject poverty. Socialism is able to achieve economic equality only at the level of poverty. In socialist societies, the benefits of a higher standard of living are, for the most part, enjoyed by a relative few who operate or cooperate with the political system. Far from being a distinctive characteristic of capitalist societies, exploitation of the masses by the privileged managerial classes is rather a characteristic feature of socialist societies. This was the case in Soviet Russia. According to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, writing in the late 1960s and quoting Andrei Sakharov, and I quote, There is great material inequality between town and country. 40% of our country's population finds itself in a very difficult economic situation. The context hints at, demands the word poverty. But when one's own country is in question, it sticks in the throat. Whereas the 5% in the boss class are as highly privileged as the corresponding groups in the USA. No, more so, we feel like retorting. But the author forestalls us with his explanations. The privileges of our country's managerial group are secret, not open, and above board. It is a matter of purchasing loyal service to the existing system by bribes, previously in the form of salaries in envelopes, but now by closed distribution of everything in short supply, foodstuffs, goods and services, and privileged access to resorts. Unquote. The exploitation of the masses by the ruling class is common in socialist societies, ancient and modern. Despite the claims of socialist propaganda, the inevitable effect of socialism is to share out the poverty, not the wealth. Except at this level of poverty, capitalist economies, that is to say free market economies, achieve much greater levels of economic equality than socialist economies achieve. Socialism has conspicuously failed at the very point of its proudest boast, its promise of economic equality and the eradication of poverty. As Igor Shavarovich pointed out in 1975, and I quote, The main achievements in social justice of the last century in the West, the reduction of the working day, social insurance, an extraordinary rise in the living standards of the workers, were accomplished with very little participation on the part of socialist movements, unquote. Capitalist societies are not only invariably wealthier societies in absolute terms, they also produce much greater levels of economic equality within society. In third world socialist societies, economic inequality is far greater than in first world societies. Furthermore, it is a mistake to characterise third world societies merely as societies that are poor in economic terms. In most third world societies, extreme poverty and extreme wealth exist in the closest proximity. It is this juxtaposition of extreme wealth with extreme poverty that characterises third world economies and contrasts so sharply with the first world economies. If the third world is to experience a greater degree of absolute wealth and relative economic equality, the only way that this can be achieved is through free market capitalism which has proved its ability to raise standards of living for everyone in society and to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor that is so evident in the socialist states of the third world. But of course, this kind of capitalist economy was only made possible in the West in the context of the Christian and specifically the Protestant culture that dominated Western society after the Reformation. Without a Christian worldview underpinning the economy, society may experience economic piracy masquerading as free markets, something that we are now seeing increasingly in the post-Christian West, but not the kind of growth and social amelioration for the population as a whole that has characterised modern Western economies over the past two centuries. 
Yet, despite these facts, Christians have become obsessed with socialism. And judging from the report in the Catholic Times, the Cardinal seemed quite oblivious of socialism's ugly and ungodly beginnings. The report stated that Cardinal Rodriguez, and I quote, went on to call the concept of globalisation a myth that masked the exploitation of the poor and added that only a new solidarity based on the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity could save the world from ruin, unquote. Well, this kind of rhetoric has been heard many times before. It is the rhetoric of the French Revolution. E. L. Hebden Taylor made the following comments on the religious idolatry underpinning this rhetoric and the inevitable implication of its implementation, and I quote, By accepting this romantic teaching, that is to say that the root of man's problem is not sin but rather his social conditions, and that therefore the solution to his problems lies not in his redemption from sin, but in science and the establishment of a utopian state that will create the necessary social conditions for man to overcome all evil. Western humanists, both liberal and conservative, have not only suppressed their own sense of sin, but they have also set idolatrous objectives for their politics. Freedom, equality and brotherhood are essentially religious ideals, to set political machinery at work to realise them is to make failure certain, and the more wholeheartedly a government devotes itself to their pursuits, the more likely it is to achieve their opposites. By what laws can men be constrained to love one another? What political compulsion will make us lay aside self-interest and suspicion and treat one another as equals? A state with such religious objectives is a totalitarian state." Unquote. Predictably, there was no mention in the report of the Cardinals commenting on Robespierre's reign of terror and Marx's call for it to be repeated, nor of the many actual repeats of the terror that have followed revolutions based on these lofty ideals both in Europe and the Third World. What's sauce for the goose is certainly not sauce for the gander in the Cardinals' book. But there again, capitalism was never that popular among Roman Catholic theologians and intellectuals, and economic progress for society as a whole was not a feature of societies dominated by the Roman Catholic social ethos. The economic progress experienced by Protestant nations following the Reformation typically lagged behind in Roman Catholic countries, where the Roman Catholic religion ensured that the masses were kept in their place by superstition and ignorance. It is truly ironic, therefore, that Roman Catholics, who are eager to be seen as champions and advocates of the poverty-stricken masses in the Third World, should bewail and point the finger so much at capitalism, a form of economic organisation of society that was, in its origin if not now, part of a Christian world view, namely Protestantism, that liberated the masses from the superstition and ignorance that had oppressed them for so long and gave them material progress and wealth hitherto undreamed of. The reason for this inconsistency, however, is not hard to discern. Liberation from the tyranny of the Roman Catholic Church was an essential precursor to the economic and social progress experienced by the Protestant nations of Northern Europe following the Reformation, and later throughout the West generally. This was in contrast to the economic stagnation and backwardness experienced by Roman Catholic nations after the Reformation, despite the great influx of gold and silver into these societies from the New World. The irony does not end here, however. The very values that the Cardinal was reported as championing, liberty, equality, fraternity, were the shibboleth of a revolution that erupted largely as a violent reaction against that very oppression of the masses in which the Roman Catholic Church was so complicit. The Roman Catholic Church persecuted and murdered the Huguenot, that's to say the Protestant Church, in France. And yet it was Protestantism that gave Britain a religious and ethical value system that enabled it to avoid a revolution of the kind that occurred in France. Had the Huguenots survived and flourished in France, as Protestantism did in Britain, it is questionable whether there would have been a French revolution of the type that actually did occur. It seems rather hypocritical 
for Roman Catholics to turn around now and accuse the capitalist form of economic organisation of being oppressive, especially in view of the fact that capitalism has been the source of virtually all the economic progress that has enabled modern societies to improve the material and social conditions of the masses, thereby alleviating oppressive poverty. The French Revolution was a reaction against a system of Roman Catholic medievalism that had passed its sell-by date 250 years previously, but which had been used to oppress the masses who were denied not only the economic progress experienced in the Protestant nations, largely as a result of the Reformation, but also the spiritual and ethical guidance, that is to say a Protestant worldview, necessary to control the burgeoning economic aspirations of society in a humane way. The result was the ungodly social explosion we call the French Revolution, the principles of which have remained with us to this day and continue to cause untold suffering for people the world over. Even Groen van Prinstere, who argued that the blame for the revolution could not be laid at the door of the ancient regime, but that it was the inevitable consequence of the advancing tide of unbelief, nevertheless acknowledged the deleterious role played by the Roman Catholic Church in preparing the ground for revolutionary ideas. Speaking of the Reformation, he says, and I quote, This beneficial impact of the Reformation came to an end as the evangelical spirit began to decline. The salt of the gospel was cast out by the Catholics and lost its savour with the Protestants. The general corruption that followed paved the way for revolutionary unbelief. Consider France, the country where the strength of the revolution has been overwhelming. Here, too, the Reformation had a positive influence on the Roman Church. Unfortunately, dragonades came to be preferred to arguments and Protestants were either chased across the border or else silenced. Still, there remained the Jansenists, the loyal Catholics who defended free grace. Their influence, however, was suppressed, a second triumph over the Reformation that debilitated the French Church. In the course of time the Jesuits came to be hated, only politics remained as a legitimate topic of public debate. Morals continued to decline in the absence of admonition and example, and learning turned to unbelief once it lacked the pious counterpoise of Port Royal. Only the outward form of religion survived, supported nonetheless from political calculation, by compulsion and persecution. A church of this kind proved powerless against the rising tide of unbelief. Likewise in Spain, Italy and the Roman Catholic part of Germany, the Protestants were either expelled or suppressed. In England, a Romanizing tendency was co-responsible for civil war under Charles I, was heavily patronised under Charles II and was finally resisted by the Anglican clergy less from religious zeal than from fear of losing power. On so poisonous a soil there arose the wretched harvest of dazed writings that have contributed so much to the spread of unbelief. Unquote. The consequences of this revolutionary tide of unbelief, which has now swept through the whole world, were summed up by Abraham Kuyper in terms that are only too familiar to our own generation. Quote, the revolution in Paris proved to be not just a change in regime, but a change of system, of political organisation, of general human theory. In place of the worship of the Most High God came, courtesy of humanism, the worship of man. Human destiny was shifted from heaven to earth. The scriptures were unravelled and the word of God shamelessly repudiated in order to pay homage to the majesty of reason. The institution of the church was twisted into an instrument for undermining the faith and later for destroying it. The public school had to wean the rising generation away from the piety of our fathers. Universities have been refashioned into institutions at which Darwinism violates the spiritual nobility of humanity by denying its creation in the image of God. Hedonism replaced heaven-mindedness and emancipation become the watchword by which people tampered with the bond of marriage, with the respect children owe to their parents, with the moral seriousness of our national manners. 
This went on until first philosophy, then socialism, raised its voice. The former replaced certainty in our hearts with doubt. The latter, logically developing upper-class liberal theory, applied to the money and goods of the owners what the liberal already had the audacity to do against God and his anointed king. Unquote. End of lecture nine. Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea, and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.